whenever bugging out popped up on screen, <laughs> mm-hmm. I said, As I don't know. He, yeah, he he is gonna he's gonna do something to bring all this tumbling down. Sal, we're gonna boycott the Texas. <laughs> 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 Again, like Sesame Street. I was just gonna say, yeah. it's so Sesame Street right there. <laughs> hey everyone, we hope you enjoyed the discussion in this video. We have fun doing it and we hope you have fun with it as well. And for those who wanna stay updated on upcoming movies, join Universal's email list and get sneak peeks at upcoming films. And you can do that by simply going over to uphe.com slash news. So, Talk about timing working out perfectly. February, Black History Month. Mm. Universal Pictures, uh, Universal Studios, looked at you and I, not you, but you and I said, you know what? Y'all are black. <laughs> you know what? We, 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 we got a lot of movies that have black people in them. Mm. And we would like to just come in and maybe partner with you to find black folk. <laughs> <laughs> and token white guy. I'm happy to be here. Yes. <clears throat> to maybe highlight some fine black cinema for the month of February, which is Black History Month. So, and they said, oh yeah, we'll pay. And I was like, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, we were planning on doing, you, you've been around for a while, loyal, wonderful toasties out there. Then you know that we were planning on doing retro reviews on the regular, probably on Sundays. And so it just worked out fine. And it was very, very well timed that they asked us to do retro reviews for black cinema at the time we were planning on doing uh, retro reviews anyway. And that is what we're going to be doing today and, and let them know what we want to do. So I picked Do the Right Thing, which I will explain why I picked this in a little bit. But I thought it would be the perfect movie to actually kick off our Black History Month retro reviews. Some of these retro reviews will actually be movies that weren't out too long ago too, mm-hmm. but cool. still worth talking about, even if it's over a couple of years, the impact that it left on black cinema and cinema in general. Okay, nice. But do the right thing, man. I saw that immediately and I said, you know what? Uh, I, 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 I was probably gonna be talking about this at some point anyway, but I, I anytime I can talk about do the right thing, which I love, I don't know how you, have you seen this? Yeah, I saw it when it came out. Yeah, so did and, I. And maybe another time after that. Uh, I honestly, I missed what we were going to talk about it today. So I, did, I otherwise I would have rewatched it. Yeah, and I didn't, I, that's what I'm saying. You know, this happened so fast that I did not ask people to rewatch this or watch it at all. Have you ever seen this movie? No, I, I have seen the film. It's just been a few years since I saw it. Okay. I think it's all one right. of Spike Lee's better movies. Oh, one yeah. His best films. There's a reason why I think this, this is perfect to uh, talk about, kick our retro <laughs> reviews off for Black History Month with this movie right here. Um, I, first of all, I have to say that uh, with this movie right here, Spike Lee, with this particular film, though this movie debuted a decade later, Spike Lee feels like he's something from New Hollywood, which is old mm-hmm. Hollywood. Mm-hmm. New Hollywood was that time that you had people like Francis Ford Coppola, mm-hmm. uh, Martin Scorsese, Brian De Palma, and a few other people who just got out the game early because they said, well, shit, Hollywood is changing and y'all not gonna let me do what I wanna do because that was a period where directors had complete control outside of the, st- or within the studio yeah, system. Yeah, within the studio system. They said, hey, you know what? As long as you guys are making money and y'all are rebels and people are loving y'all, you're kind of you're, you're kind of rock stars of cinema right now. And there's a young Brian De Palma and Martin Scorsese right there. They said, you know what? Y'all do whatever you want until one of y'all, <laughs> <laughs> which you let somebody have complete control. Uh-huh. That's what happens. Mm. Uh, but Spike Lee, man, Spike Lee was sort of like these people from New Hollywood, except with more black awareness and more emphasis on style. Mm-hmm. Sure, He was 29 when he made the movie. She's got to have it. If you've ever seen that movie or heard about it, he was only 32 when he wrote, produced and directed do the right thing. We gonna do something. We gonna regret it for the rest of our lives. Man, I, I I watched this again last night, right before we talked to, to put this together to talk about, and uh, I'm just gonna tell you right now because this is not really a review. Review, you know, this is more of a discussion mm-hmm. uh, about this film right here. So I. 
seriously one of my favorite movies today and I it still blows my mind that Spike Lee was 32 when he when he did this man if you don't rem remember the movie or if you need a refresher if you haven't seen the movie uh cool premise it's the hottest day of the summer in a predominantly black Brooklyn neighborhood and the tensions are starting to rise as people's racial and cultural differences are starting to reach a boiling point. Sal played by, I'll find him over here, Sal played by Danny Aiello, mm -hmm. who died the, not the, too long ago. The, the late Danny Aiello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When did he die? He died like 2017? I, I think. think so. I know it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, it was, he was like 83 at the time. Mm -hmm. Man, incredible performance by this guy, as you will see. Before I forget, uh, Danny Aiello, he, he had an Academy Award. For that right, uh, I, I don't sure know. nomination I, yeah. at least. Right? I think he won. Somebody let me know, but uh, it was funny because Spike Lee had become such a such a known talent at the time that he was. Uh, people were wanting to work with him. He was uh, one of those guys who was he was being seen as uh, one of almost one of the geniuses of cinema at that point. And so he was getting all these famous people to work with him. Sal, played by uh, Danny Aiello, was going to be played by Robert De Niro mm -hmm. wow. at one point. Robert De Niro just said, no, I don't want to play this. And they're like, why? He said, because part of the movie is things blow up when a dude named Radio Raheem doesn't want to turn his radio down. And Robert De Niro was like, well, shit, in my neighborhood, if you walk into a pizzeria and somebody asks you to turn your radio down, they turn your radio down. He said, I don't want to say the problem. <laughs> the problem's the premise. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. He says, I'm just saying, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't understand this, Spike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are we doing here? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so he didn't win, somebody said. Uh, but yeah, man. Uh, so the reason why I chose this from Universal's uh, catalog which is one of the movies that they offered. They, they, you can make some recommendations, but I saw that and I said immediately, that's yeah, for right, sure. that one right there. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a Black History Month review, uh, listen, this is more, this, this right here, and it couldn't be a more appropriate time to talk about this movie. I mean, you got to understand that we're living in a time when America is still struggling simply to talk about race to a point where people in power are trying to ban talking about race. Right. It is interesting. To, you watch this movie and to realize what is 1989. Yeah. And so much of what's going on in it. You're like, wow, we still haven't progressed past this. No, no we have not. <laughs> like I said, people don't want to talk about America's racist history. We are still, you know, people, you know, for a while, people is kind of like, all right, you know, we'll talk about it as long because we still control the narrative right here. But now that shit is coming out because we're in a very informational age or, you know, this information age, a digital information age, people trying to ban discussions about race. Mm, you know, yeah. first they tried to get in and said, oh, well, we just don't want to talk to these kids over here, even though it never was. And now they just that, you know, I never like to use a slippery slope argument, but they slipped on that slope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to the point where they just said, now nah, we're coming after everything. Martin Luther King. Yeah. Now. The thing with this is that uh, Do the Right Thing, this is 1989, Do the Right Thing came in and took a bold heads on, just kicking the nuts approach to the topic of race, man. It is it is intentionally uncomfortable. You know, uh, I remember this is how uncomfortable it is. And I, I'd like to get your opinion on what you sure, thought about this sure, when you sure, saw it. Sure. I remember there's a white dude that I was in the National Guard with. And uh, he said, uh, he said, yeah, man, you know, I, I look, I want to be open minded. I want to be, you know, uh, uh, I want to be sensitive to, to 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 people like yourself at the time, which he wasn't. <laughs> he was racist. <laughs> but and we, were, we, we were friends. That's how yeah, it was. We yeah. were friends. But he told me straight up like, no, I, I you know, what? no, I like you guys. I like black people. I just don't want you to marry my sister. That's all. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you used to get that a lot back then. Yeah. 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 He said, but listen, man, you know, I. I like Sir Mix a lot, you know. I, I nah. tried. He said, "So everybody's talking about this this, this Spike guy, you know." I, so I tried to watch do, watch do the right thing, and you know, and uh, I, I, I tuned in at the, at a time when it's just a bunch of black people just tearing shit up, and I said, "No, nah, that's all right." <laughs> he said, <laughs> "He said that's you know that's a little scary to me." <laughs> so I'm like, "Hey man, you know, one step at a time." Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> go, go watch Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do the Right Thing is not a struggle movie. It's an anti-struggle no. movie. Yeah. And this is at a time when Spike Lee was emerging as a voice when 
a lot of people of color didn't have the mm-hmm. kind of voice mm-hmm. that Spike Lee was going in and, you know, again, just breaking down barriers and and having uh given that represent representation that people didn't have. You know, this is a movie where you're right, it was very angry. Yeah. It was very open and, and upfront about it. It was raw. It was very it was it was confrontational oh, with mm-hmm. it too. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. No, the the movie is unrelentingly in your face. It, yeah. Like it like, yeah, yeah, there's you know, it, there's humor in there to, to kind of, you know, <laughs> trick you coming into coming in the door and it's in your face the whole time and it never stops. And most any movie that would even touch that would go to it but then kind of go like, but it's okay. And and <laughs> yeah. this doesn't do that. Yeah. No, yeah. no, that's yeah. that that's one of the things that's going on with this film, man. Uh, some people don't want to watch this because they still think because it's so bold, because it is so upfront and in your face with, with these issues that people think like, oh, that's Spike hating on white people again. <laughs> and it's and, and and contrary to what some people think, it's not. Everyone in this movie is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone yeah. in this movie is a problem. And still everyone's kind of justified too. It is not an easy movie to, mm-hmm. like you said, it's no, it's no, uh, there's no one person here that says, oh, that person deserves sympathy. Eh, almost, almost. Eh, 90% of, of the people in this movie are a problem. Mm-hmm. They're all flawed. They're, They're all, all flawed. All flawed. You know, the thing I want to do with this, and we're about to get into this discussion head on, even though we're here already, but we're about to get deeper now with this. Uh, so the talking points that I want to get done with this are, you know, the filmmaking, the writing, directing, the entertainment value of this, the production, uh, the impact of the film, its legacy. But let's go ahead and get into uh, the writing of this film, man. You know, uh, Spike Lee, you know, his direction, but mainly his writing. Uh, man, the writing in this movie is incredibly sharp. You know, it's and, and the reason why that's lost on some people, because this movie uh, is full, it's stereotypes. It's full of stereotypes, man. And... I think that, you know, people notice that you're right. I can't argue with you on that. Uh, You go through the different groups. All of them are just pretty much, if you take it for face value, visually, they are, and I guess to a certain extent, on the surface, their personalities too, very stereotypical. Uh, The Italians in here, man. The Italians in here, you know, they all wearing wife beaters and they're all about their bagoozas and bazinis. <laughs> <laughs> it's cabagool, Corey. It's cabagool. Cabagool. You know, all the, most of the names end in O. Yeah. Pino, Vino. <laughs> you know, and they all, and every time they talk, they always got the, the Italian the hands. hands. You know, they always they always out like this. Or uh, you know, and you know how the New York uh, Italian people talk. Yeah. Hey, pop. Hey, why you gotta talk to me like that? Yeah. Hey. Oh, Oh! Oh! <laughs> Vito, get a broom, sweep out front. Huh? Get a broom and sweep <laughs> out front! He tells me to do what you told him what to do. Hey, what a matter you, you know? <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> John, John Turturro is racist as in this movie, but he's amazing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he's fun. John Turturro <laughs> is so good in this movie, yeah, man. Yeah. Everybody's so good. Yeah. The blacks. All of them extra black, and I ain't talking about just color either. I'm talking about you know they they ex- they're, they're either extremely black conscious mm. to the point of just being obnoxious, like the character of bugging out. I, man, out of all the characters in this movie, bugging out was the one that. <laughs> that just irritated me the most. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm like, like John Turturro is a straight up racist, but I can't stand bugging out. Bugging out, <laughs> appropriately named. Yeah. Bugging out everywhere he uh, goes, he's man. An irritant. Yeah, he's a and, troublemaker, and he's not doing anything. No, he's not. No, he's, he's talking shit constantly. Yes, and he's always got his priorities wrong. Mm-hmm. Instead of going out and trying to do something for the neighborhood, he's worried about. Oh, yeah, Sal's wall. I want some black people on that wall. Why don't you do some for the black people off the wall in the streets over here yeah. for the neighborhood? Bugging out, who's played by Giancarlo Esposito mm-hmm, yeah. before he uh, started making meth at his chicken place. <laughs> <laughs> so he was never a good guy. But man, he's, you know, he's he's just, you want to, it's cool to be black conscious. It's great yeah, yeah, to like, yeah, yeah. it's great to, you know, keep that awareness out there, but you ain't got to be obnoxious like him with it. Look, we got some brothers up on the wall, you know? Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela, you know, you know Michael Jordan, tomorrow. Come on, yeah. you get him out, right? Yeah, man, you know, it's it's he's one of the things that's leading to some of the biggest problems in this movie. Not mm-hmm. not the movie itself, but some of the problems that we see occur in the film. Mm-hmm. He's part of the powder keg that blows up, man. Mookie 
who's actually played. Now, a lot of people say Spike Lee is not the best actor, and he's not in a lot of his movies. He's not. But for some reason here, and I don't know, I think he was just really invested in this film, and maybe this personality is him, that he, where he plays Mookie, but he was really good in this mm-hmm. movie, man. But Mookie is trifling. <laughs> Mookie is... <laughs> <laughs> Like Mookie makes points every now and then, yeah. and Mookie's, you know, he's he's you he's he's dropping some knowledge, and 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 you can't really argue with him on certain things that he sees. But really, man, this guy's just he don't want to do shit. He want to make quick money. Mm-hmm. Don't take care of his kids. Living with his sister. Hey, Sal's gonna be mad. You know, Lady Sal. You know, sometimes I think you're more concerned about him and me, and I'm your own brother. Yeah. <laughs> work. Slavery days are over. My name ain't Kunta Kinte. Ain't nobody <laughs> said your name Kunta Kinte just because you're supposed to be doing your job. He yeah. escalates a lot in the film. He really does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hate that kind of shit, man. Go do your job, man. What I look like a slave? To you. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> Dumbass. I feel like he's the prototype for Earn in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, oh. I was like, but you think you're smarter than everybody else, but you got a kid you're not taking care of and you're not working. Oh no, Earn is much. At least Earn tries. I mean, to keep no, Earn does finally start getting things going. Yeah, yeah man. And he's, you know, gets to the point, he's loud to all the black people in this movie, just just loud at some point. Uh, I just figured, okay, it's New York. That's just, yeah. <laughs> that is no, New that's York. Yeah. no, that's what it is. Stressed it's also out. part of that, too. Because the only people louder than blacks are the Puerto Ricans. <laughs> I told you I am not going to babysit for you, and that's it. No, I'm not going to give you to hold on to you. Boy, I had to take my headphones out doing that part. I know. And when I did, I looked at him, there was blood on him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember watching this in the movie. And when it opens with her dancing. I was like, man, this chick is so hot. And Rosie starts, Perez. Yeah. yeah. And when she started talking, I was like, ah, Ugh. oh, never mind. Oh, oh yeah. I just could not handle that. Every that time. Voice. Yeah. Every time she said, Mookie, my penis got soft. Uh-huh. <laughs> Mookie! Mookie! <laughs> <laughs> I changed my name. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so all all of these are look straight up. You can't argue with with anybody, man. When they say that they're stereotypes, but it can be also argued that these stereotypes are very much intentional. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is because you know a lot of the roots of racism go to stereotypes, and so everyone in this neighborhood is looking at each other as stereotypes. Yeah. We're kind of seeing everyone through the eyes of everyone. Interesting in this movie right here, everyone is looking at the most basic form of everyone, the most basic form that allows those people to dislike those people, compete with those people, hate those people, see them as, as, as superior to those people. Uh, you can see that. Now, if you've seen the movie, y'all, you know, there's a really brilliant moment in the movie where it it, it stops. And this is what I love about Spike Lee. Spike Lee, he, he never goes out, except every now and then, especially if he's working on a studio movie that, that where the script was given to him. But his own filmmaking style is I don't know, man. It could be avant-garde in a way. He never really tells a straight narrative when he's writing his own thing, sometimes to a fault. But there's a moment here where the movie stops for everyone to just pretty much look at the camera and really get how they get out how they feel about the other groups here. And when he when, when these people come and do this part, they are describing these people in the worst stereotypes that they can. Dago Wab, Ganey, Garlic Bread, Pizza Sling, and Spaghetti Benin, Vic Damone, Perry Como, Luciano Pavarotti, Solo Fried Chicken, and Biscuit Eating Monkey Ate. Yeah, he make us sound good, <laughs> actually. <laughs> fried Chicken and Biscuit Eating. Fried Chicken and Biscuit Oh my God, that's kind of a compliment. You sound delicious. Yeah. <laughs> Have a plate of that. Yeah. In fact, all of these sound like a, a dish on a racist menu. You spaghetti slay. Hey, hey garlic, we can come together around bread. food, right? All yeah, the culture. Man. Yeah, we got good food. Yeah, no, I, this, I mean, <laughs> I mean, this stuff was terrible. It's vile, but the delivery of these people, man, it's an amazing scene. And, and again, the dialogue is written so well, and these actors are so good that they even make these stereotypes, uh, these delicious. ugly, these ugly scenes delicious, and also just make these lines sound brilliant. Can biscuit eating monkey? Thank you. Pizza, pizza, and go to back to Africa. Okay, you actually ready to roll now? <laughs> <laughs> I was just warming up, Spike. I was just warming up. Get in the character. Yeah, the camera didn't even feel that. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was just him at the craft services yeah. table. Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that I believe really that these were written intentionally to be stereotypes because 
uh, as I said, on the surface, that's how they come across. And I believe that's why, because he, because they're, they're, you know, Spike is trying to reflect what the neighborhood sees in other people. But when they start to get into these characters, when these characters start having one-on-one -on -one interactions, when these characters start actually, when we start getting more complex with them, mm. we start getting more, you know, deep into their characters, man, um, they start saying some things of substance. Mm -hmm, right. You know, they their dialogue exchange has real meaning. And, you know, of course, I can't show you every part of the movie that does that, but I can show you some of my favorite parts. I really love that exchange between Mookie and and, and uh, Pino, played by John Turturro. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, yeah then, and that's where you can see, like, okay, you know, no, these characters were written that way on purpose to look like flat, stereotypical characters. Because once they start really getting into the deep dialogue with them, they're really more complex characters than we initially, initially thought. It's different. Magic, Eddie, Prince. I'm not... I mean, they're not black. I mean, I mean, they're black, but they're not really black. They're, they're more than black. It's, it's, it's yeah, make up your mind. Man. <laughs> <All right. laughs> when, when somebody starts stuttering and yeah, stammering I'm like that, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you haven't really thought this through. Yeah, no, yeah. no, you ain't saying nothing. Different. Yeah, to me, it's, it's different. You know, deep down inside, I think you wish you were black. <laughs> Keep hope alive. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't stand John Turturro, but I also love him in the movie, yeah, man. He's, yeah. he's had so many great lines. And John Turturro is just a great actor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Him and Spike Lee are actually good friends, too. Oh, oh I figured. Okay. Yeah. Hey, yeah. well, after this exchange, I figured they played. Yeah. They, they <laughs> <happen with> <laughs> Got that out the way. They get very honest with each other with that. Well, it's the kind of thing with the movie. It's like, you know, when they're when they have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. Like, What's the old saying? Like, a, a person is smart, but people are dumb. Mm -hmm. And so it's like in this movie when I've noticed when there's bigger groups of people, like then they become more stereotypical. Then it gets like really rambunctious and over the top. Yeah. Or, but when you have more intimate conversations here, it's like, okay, you've actually seen their perspectives. Yeah. As flawed as their perspectives might be. Exactly, man. Mm -hmm. And plus, that's a real thing where people, they don't want to justify their, you know, they, they, they want to defend their racism by talking about that the black people that they really love. Well, you know, they're not really black. Mm -hmm. And I, I am not <laughs> bullshitting. I spent so much time in high school trying to describe to everybody how Jimi Hendrix is black. I don't mm -hmm. know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, you know, sure, he, he might be black, but there's a white man in there somewhere. <laughs> Good Lord, what's up with you? Who's, who, who, who's running shit? <laughs> what is this? Is this like, is this like meet Dave and this little white man controlling me? <laughs> who told you? Oh, no. Abort! Abort! Get out of here! Now figured it out. <laughs> There's a white man in there somewhere. And that's how Jimi Hendrix died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Looking at this scene right here is a, is a, is, is, it's a great example of having a lot to say. You know, Spike Lee has been accused of trying to say too much in his movies sometimes. And I agree with that. But in this movie here, he weaves his messages into dialogue so well that they don't come across as preachy. Again, they feel very natural when they're talking. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. it was one of the times he was able to do that, I think, successfully, where it it blended. It all led to one yeah. really big thing. It's all these pieces that are in and up as opposed to his other so many of his other movies, especially recently, and it's a lot of, yeah, and what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And you're yeah. like, can we stay on one or two su exactly. subjects? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I agree. No, his, his, his movies can be disjointed when he's trying to say something. Here, he balanced it out well and made it feel natural. Also, even if some of these characters are, oh, oh let me see here. Uh, yes, people, even some of these characters are uh, stereotypes. They are entertaining. You know, I mean, it's just sure. the moments where you just <clears throat> these characters are funny. And I don't care how flat they may come across, uh, which in this movie, that's a feat within itself to make them entertaining. Because, as I said, most of the people in this movie are not likable people. Mm -hmm. I don't you know, I understand that, you know, they, they I understand the root of the problem the social economic problem of what's going on with most of the people in this neighborhood. But still, they're a bunch of assholes, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I. I, I, I was thinking about that scene where they, I mean, because there's some scenes where you just, people, they do things they ain't got to do. Like the 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 scene of that, uh, that guy going by in his convertible. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. And the guy said, man, listen, I want to drive through. I'm waiting for y'all to get out the way. I'm in a convertible. You're not going to get me wet, are you? And they were like, no, nah, man, go on through. Well. Go ahead. Not go ahead. Just hurry up, Drive man, the car. Damn. All right, I'm driving. 
<laughs> they did not have to no. do that, man. Yeah, but he was kind of being a dick, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, he asked him to move first. <laughs> I mean, and he said, listen, I don't want to drive. I just want to drive through. Y'all ain't going to get me wet now. And I'm like, no, man, come on. I don't even know. I, now, I will say some of that is on him, too, because I would say I ain't trust none of these. I would have back why, up, back why up. Would you, why would you trust them? Plus, plus he's on that skin, skin, skin. <laughs> like, hey, you get out of the way. Like, all right. Man, raise your hood. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a whole production. You got to get out of the car and, and you do it. No, no, no. Well, no. Well, I mean, it'll, it'll take it part away, but you still got to get out. Oh, and push okay. It over all well, them. shit, you know, go in reverse, man. <laughs> go around. Yeah, pick a different street. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take a detour. <laughs> they lit your ass. <laughs> they're aiming it too. They want to make sure. I know. I know. <laughs> they not have to do that. Man. I know. Like, if he had just gone through quickly, he might have got a little bit of a spritz, but it's yeah. just like a fire hose on it. Man, and, and everyone, everyone in this movie, I guess almost everyone. Everyone. That's like little baby Martin Lawrence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How'd you feel about how the way he talked, man? He had a lisp in the movie. Oh, I, I don't remember. Yeah, his tongue out the whole time. He talked like this. Oh. Come on, mm-hmm. man. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna get too wet. I was like, that's weird. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, he, but he's hardly in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Probably did that to make him stand out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and almost all these characters, like I say, about 90 percent, 95 percent of these of these characters in here, all of them have their own racism. All of them have their own prejudices. Uh, you know, we we see it in, 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 in some of the characters that initially we think we're supposed to actually have sympathy for. 20 C energizer. D, learn to speak English first. All right. D. You know what? I I can see where you're coming from. <laughs> I mean, he shouldn't be he shouldn't be that abrasive with it. But damn, it's I, one letter. <laughs> I, I, I I get the frustration and I get why he's coming from. It's just that learn to speak English. That's when you're like, don't don't say don't, that. Don't say that. You just no. lost the argument. <laughs> yeah. Now you look like the ass. But, yeah, they, but, exactly. they, but they pushed his ass. Just, man, look, you heard me. It's, it's one way to actually say a whole word. Right, we actually right. say a letter. Yeah. D. I'll see y'all. <laughs> but still, he. You're right. I mean, look, he has his own prejudices yeah, about yeah. these people. Mm-hmm. So everyone in here, as I said, you know, it's not it's not necessarily Spike Lee's making a pro black movie right here. He's making a movie about just the general nature of racism itself, mm-hmm. which we will dive into in a little bit more about that message. Uh, but uh, I was talking about how some of these characters are entertaining, despite them having flaws, despite them probably being unlikable people eventually uh, and despite them being stereotypes. Some of my favorite uh, people in here are some of the biggest stereotypes that we see in movies. Uh, the old black dude sitting around talking oh, shit. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> they, they, they were the best part, especially Robin Harris. Yeah, the three black tears <laughs> here, man. Robin Harris, yeah. Man, you know, it's, it's like, like, like they ain't really old, old, but they probably too old to be sitting around doing this. Like, do something. <laughs> but there's a lot of people in here who are just kind of around, just hanging out. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, don't, don't y'all have jobs? But, but the, with them, yeah, they on, they, you know, you, they're on disability. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and drunk. And drunk. <laughs> yeah, they, they're, they're, they're getting hot. They, like, they drunk on cheap beer. Mm-hmm. And you're right. You know, at the time, I was like, oh, these three old, old dudes. And I'm looking at them now, like, they ain't that old. They ain't that old. But, <laughs> but they, they're getting ready. They're training. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Robin Harris had me laughing. Robin, the late great Robin Harris. Robin Harris was an up and coming comedian back in the nineties. Man, he was set to blow up. He's y'all. A lot of people remember him as the dad from House Party. Right, right. He's he's one of those comedians like Bernie Mac that right at the point of hitting the high point of fame, about fifty, had a heart attack and had, died. Had man. a heart attack and died, man. Uh, but he, this guy is so funny that. In the middle of the movie, he just starts performing a comedy bit and forgets that he's in a movie. <laughs> and he's so funny that I think Spike Lee just let it just go let it and go. didn't leave a cut because there's a moment this brother looks straight at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> he like he's he's so used to performing to a crowd. Right. He looks at the camera. It ain't never too hot. I never too cold. I mean, you look at the camera and like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure did. <laughs> I mean, look at this, yo. <laughs> I remember when I watched this in the, in the theater, I was like, did he just look at me? <laughs> you know, all of these are just little chunks of story that we get, little interactions from people that we get. Uh, and, and, and it can be hard if you don't know anything about the movie or haven't seen it in a while or haven't seen it at all to see where things are going, 
you know, what this is leading up to, especially because a lot of this movie is played up comedically. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it may, may, it's played up for laughs. Um, but most of these vignettes in this movie, they're like little packs of dynamite that just laying throughout <laughs> yeah. right. the film. And all of it is going to contribute to this explosive and powerful ending that you get, man. And while people don't know where it's going, you know, we're all laughing at this. We're all having a good time. But there is there is a sense of dread that happens because they're just there are characters here who just won't let things go <laughs> in the movie. They're characters who are going around, as we said, starting trouble. And we know that that since they're troublemakers, they're going to be the ones to just make this whole thing collapse because everybody's already mad. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if there's if there's one villain in this movie, it's the sun. The sun, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just frying people's brains. With people already on edge, and you got this one clown going around just edging people on. You know, the, that that's the one that when I watched this movie for, for the first time, I didn't know where it was going. Whenever Bugging Out popped up on screen, <laughs> mm -hmm. I said, I like, oh no. He, yeah, he he is gonna he's gonna do something to bring all this tumbling down. Sal, we're gonna boycott the Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Again, like Sesame Street. I was just gonna say, yeah. it's so Sesame Street right there. Is your, is your boycott up your ass? You got a boycott. You know, uh, wow. you want to say the sound? Don't don't engage with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you man. Have a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah, that's just, but Bug and Ass a hard guy to uh, to ignore, man. <laughs> True. I mean, come on, he's popping up like a muffin <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> in the window. Sal, how you gonna ignore that? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a hand up his behind right now. <laughs> <laughs> popping up there like a black conscious Elmo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even with that hair, he looks like a muppet. <laughs> he does, yeah. <laughs> At the start of the film, I mean, I, I love the way you have the movie has has its own like a uh, uh, what, what would they call it the the storyteller the barb you know the, oh yeah the, yeah the guy that goes through like in Shakespeare and other tales from that 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 period your stories were kind of held together are connected through somebody going in and narrating mm -hmm. sure. usually a musical person a barb or something but they but here you have Samuel Jackson, I love this narrative device right here where he's the he's the DJ and he's he's the one that kind of there's so many characters. He's the one that kind of introduces us to a lot of characters. Mm -hmm. He's the one that actually sets the scene for the events that are about to happen. He's the one that sets the atmosphere for the neighborhood. Oh! I have today's forecast for you. If you have a Jerry Curl, stay in the house or you'll end up with a permanent plastic ailment on your head forever. I want y'all to notice something, man. Uh, about 88, 89, you start to see Jerry Curls disappear. <laughs> because, because movies started pointing out, like, coming to America. Coming to man, America, man, Mocking it. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Coming to America, even movies like Hollywood Shuffle, oh, they yeah. started targeting the Jerry uh, Curl. Uh -huh. And people start looking at them curls. I'm like, oh, man, yeah, I got okay, yeah. I gotta get rid of this. I gotta wipe this shit. Off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yo, it, it's funny. Uh, Samuel uh, Jackson. I mean, Spike Lee brought him back to do mm -hmm. the same kind of role in Chirac, where he was, you know, the, 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 the bard, the one who's narrating. The, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the role he plays as that neighborhood DJ on the radio, mm -hmm. uh, that has disappeared. Like, like, you know, now now radio is all automated. It comes from one place. You get a DJ. They're just there to do a little comedy bit and really uh, keep tee, tee it up for what's already programmed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But back in those days, you would have a DJ who would come on and could talk to specific things that are going on in your town. You remember, like, yeah, you remember the Warriors? Yeah. Where the, uh, the Warriors had a DJ telling everybody what where the mm -hmm. Warriors were mm -hmm. and also watching out for the Warriors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you ever I, seen the Warriors? I, I have, but it's been so long. Long, I don't remember, I don't remember that DJ character. Yeah, yeah, she would come on. It was a female, and she would oh, come wow. on and tell her, you know, she would kind of tell the Warriors where to go, where it's oh, okay. safe and whatnot. Yeah, huh. man. But that that was one of the things I always lamented went away with with uh, corporatized automated radio. Yeah, it's like, man, you're just gonna mm -hmm. lose everything that made you know made your station local. Yeah. Hmm. Well, today he'd be a podcaster now. <laughs> I suppose, but but you know, even then the podcast would it would be edited and then <laughs> yeah, and even those are made for national audiences, that is not true. for local. That is true. I tell you, one of the things 
also that was going on with Samuel Jackson during this time. Uh, Samuel Jackson popped up in movies, and I, he used to be the scariest black person I'd ever yeah. seen. Yeah, 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 he did. <laughs> <laughs> and coming yeah. to America, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, 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 those big intense eyes, yeah, and I was just stare you down without, blinking. yeah. <laughs> and this movie where everybody's on edge and losing their mind about to blow this neighborhood up. He's the nicest black person. I know. There. He's the calmest one. Yeah, he he really is. Yes, <laughs> because he's insulated. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the shade. It's probably cool in there. Yeah. yeah. Yes, there's a lot of social issues going on with this movie right here. Uh, but the movie really is ahead of its time while it talks about other things. When I watched this last night, man, I noticed things that I really hadn't noticed before because I didn't think they were a big deal at the time. Mm. You know, when I watched it, I was just, I, you know, I didn't, I know that it would have a lot of relevance 30 years later. Yeah, I know. I know. That, that's, that's sad. Same yeah, stuff. yeah. You know, it's, it's touching on race issues. You know, uh, of course, but it's also touching on non-race issues. Before th these things were widely talked about, uh, you know, there's a lot of tension in this neighborhood because everybody's starting to feel that they don't really have as much of an ownership in this neighborhood anymore. They don't have as much of a say in this neighborhood. Businesses are being taken over by non-black businesses. Uh, gentrification. Mm -hmm. They, you know, seriously, before people even knew the word gentrification. I know. I know. <laughs> when gentrification sounds like something you would do in your garden or something like that, people, <laughs> you know, this movie touched on it. Mm -hmm. I own this brownstone. Who told you to buy a brownstone on my block in my neighborhood on my side of the street? Free country. Man, I should oh say that stupid shit alone. <laughs> You know, and, I mean, Bug and I kind of got a point. He got a point. He got a good point. It's just, I still hate him. <laughs> you know, I, 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 can't, no, I can't stand him either. But, you know, it's like, maybe calm your ass down. It's a better way to say it. Yeah, it's a better way to say it. But that scene also has a, again, Spike Lee's writing this awesome, man. He uh, that, that scene has a great ending. Then why'd you move back to Massachusetts? I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> like they got no leg to stand over this guy right here, yeah. man. Like I said, a lot of people feel like they just don't have a voice in the neighborhood anymore. But I was talking about how you talked about things outside of race issues, man. Spike Lee in this movie was talking about climate change before was people. He? Yes, before I people, mean, I guess with it getting so hot. I guess. Yeah, but a lot, but man, in 89, I mean, people were mentioning it in yeah, climate yeah, yeah, change. Yeah, yeah. And this is people, this is 30 years later. Spike Lee told us if we don't do something, mm -hmm. we're gonna be swimming. And he, he and he mentioned it with science that we hear very much today. If this hot weather continues, it's going to melt the polar caps and the whole wide world. And all those parts that ain't water already will surely be flat. <laughs> we weren't talking about no polar caps back then. Mm -hmm. That's back when people thought polar caps were a brand of popsicle or something, man. <laughs> yeah, wait, wasn't that a, a candy you could buy at the movies? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, man. Uh, oh, and here's another thing. Hey, listen, I know everybody going around talking about Wakanda forever and all that kind of stuff, but back then, nobody gave a damn about no Black Panther. <laughs> Let's, let, let's be real. You know, everybody talking about Spider-Man, Batman, I, I, Superman. I did. Yeah, but, yeah you, but you nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't nobody talking about Black Panther on that kind of level. Mm -hmm. Sure. Spike Lee was trying to tell us, though. Black panther -y pizza. We pizza. <laughs> boy. Was there an issue with Black Panther was eating pizza? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Team up with Spider-Man. Spider-Man's like, hey, Black Panther, you're cool. Let's go get some pizza. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sure. You, you got to try to sound famous. <laughs> Production is great in this movie. Uh, Ernest Dickerson did the cinematography at the time. Ernest Dickerson's gone on to direct tons of TV shows and episodes. He did Walking Dead for a while. He, he directed that movie Juice also. Mm. Uh, a few other things. Um, but... The feeling of uh, being hot in this movie is done so well. Because everybody's sweating. Because yeah. everybody's wet. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's moist, moist, man. You know, everything is everything is red, you know. Everything is colored red or hot or, you know, uh, very bright, hot colors, man. Um, no, so he's, it, I mean, it's the, the feeling of heat is, is portrayed very well in this film right here. Uh, but Spike Lee's style, I told you, he's an auteur. He's a, he's a he has a style where he embraces style. He embraces trends, you know. He 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 embraces the culture and loves to put that in his movies. Might date his movies a little bit, but he loves to. He, I mean, he 
He loves it. Uh, and I just love that. The, he also believes, like, do not waste any part of the film. I remember him being on an uh, interview. I don't know if it was on BET actually years ago, but he just says, man, I don't I don't understand when movies just like put words up on the screen. He said, I think that sucks when you used to open a movie, open a movie with credits and it's just a blank screen showing names. Mm -hmm. He's you know, he he believes like I believe every frame should be used for something artistic. That's why you have that great opening in here. Like Rosie Perez dancing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't really have anything to do with the movie. No, nothing. But he just he just wanted a really cool image, man. And he wanted to some, some really artistic production. So he just had Rosie Perez dance. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, everybody yeah. back in the day, yeah, like, yeah, God yeah. Damn, yeah. who is this girl, oh, man? Mm -hmm. Rosie Perez. And then she opened her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Monkey. Oh, oh. Man. He created a Spike Lee was very influential because he embraced style. Mm -hmm. Man, Spike Lee has such an influence on pop culture. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you look at his Nike commercials and just some of the music that he included in his movies, he created a a, a, a hip hop anthem. You know, uh, uh Public Enemy, uh, Fight the Power. Chris is like, tell me what that is so I can never go there. <laughs> 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 what name is that? Well, was that song created for this movie? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, they included on the album, but mm -hmm. I, yeah. yeah, but you know, this is that, I think this was created for the film. Uh, but you know, he created a hip hop anthem. But what I love about this is that because, listen, if any other studio had, control over this. Spike Lee was kind of given more leeway than the average director. Mm -hmm. But if a studio had control this, this movie would have been full of just hip hop and R&B songs and whatnot. I love it that he was going in and he created a hip hop anthem or, you know, he's responsible for putting a hip hop anthem out there. This film set up Spike as a cinematic voice. And I mentioned this already. You know, we're talking about Black History Month, talking about black cinema and a little Black History Month. Spike Lee, you want to talk about black excellence here uh, and big contributor to Black History Month. I mean, this is something where Spike Lee, he he came in at a time and, and, and you know, he was he had a great cinematic voice and he was an auteur trying to say something, man. And he wanted to represent the unrepresented in film. You know, there was not y'all got to understand, like there was nothing really like Spike Lee on that level. True. There were. If you go back in the day, I mean, if you're talking about like the early days of, of, of film, 30s, 20s, you know, there was, there was black cinema, mm -hmm. but it was always kind of kept at, a, at reach. Yeah, with mm -hmm. limited resources <clears throat> and, and, you know, they were clipped in their message and this had none of that. Matter of fact, it had the resources and a, a talented, skilled director. That was one of the things that set mm -hmm. it apart. They're like, wait, this is a black film and the people working on this actually know what they're doing? Yeah. Actually a cut above? <laughs> what? I'm not used to this. <laughs> well, it wasn't that they didn't, you know, like black directors didn't know what they were doing before. It was that for some reason, Spike Lee came at a time where he was given a chance that other people didn't That's have. That's what I mean. Yeah, he he was given, a you know, probably a budget that people didn't have. He was given a, a voice that people didn't have. Uh, you know, he he... He came in at the right moment and he was the one. And, and he the, 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 the thing is, not just the right timing. I mean, he was a unique visionary guy mm -hmm. or is a unique visionary guy, man. He he had the talent to back it up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, you know, it's uh, it, it was amazing, man, uh, to see this movie and see that this guy was like, wow, this did if you. Seriously, if you ask me, Spike Lee creatively is a genius. You know, I've seen just based on about two or three of his films. You can say whatever you want to about the rest of the stuff. Um, you know, now here's where I'm going to ask people to go. And we're about to wrap this up here because much has been said about the end of this movie, you know, because you know, because this is Spike Lee. You know, the movie is done with a strong black voice. But a lot of people still see Sal for some reason as the villain. It's a very complex ending, man, where like. Everyone is a contributor here, and yet everyone is also sort of a victim. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's still, again, it's very complex with this man because the real enemy here is not Sal. Uh, it's not even really the police per se. You know, it's racism and the feeling of of of, of being of feeling powerless. No one offers any easy answers. <laughs> Spike Lee, that's very honest. That's yeah. very honest. Yeah. <laughs> Spike Lee has, in fact, Spike Lee has no answers. 
He says, you know, I can I, I can I can say what we should do, we can do the right thing, but there there are no answers to be had. And that's I that, I think this that's cool for a movie to try to come out and say I got a message, but I ain't got no solutions. Mm-hmm. That's probably why the movie has been able to stay relevant for 30 years. <laughs> As we, we opened yep. up this conversation. Yeah. You know, I mean, if he was to propose answers, it would come off as preachy. Yep. It sure would. That's a great point. And might date it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. everyone has a moment where they don't look good. But everyone also has a moment where they're kind of sympathetic. Except... Except bugging out. Except so. bugging <laughs> Well, I actually, no. have, a, I know, I actually I know. have something about The only people I would say probably are the police here. But, you know, they're the ones who are probably the least unsympathetic, if deserving any sympathy at all, which if you ask me, none. But we're going to talk about the ending here and just how com- com- complex this ending is. So if you have not seen the movie and you don't really want to go into detail about it, this is the time to walk away. That's why I kind of saved it for this part. But. For those who have seen the movie, it, it could be a great discussion here. And I would love to hear what other people have to say, because, I, you know, because the movie has no answers. What I see here might not be the same for everybody. But I can tell you what I see here and see what you guys think, man. Everything comes to a head in, in the climax of this movie when bugging out goes out and starts messing with Sal. And then he to a point where because there are no black people on that wall. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Because there are no black people on that wall, uh, bugging out is going around and telling everybody to to to, to boycott. Don't go yet at Sal's. Sal's needs some black people on the wall. Um, no one is buying. No 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 one is buying this, except one person, Radio Raheem. And Radio Raheem is already upset that he got kicked out earlier for walking in with his radio and being told to turn it down. Uh, for playing his music too loud. And here's where things finally blow up in this in, in, incredibly tense, but if you ask me, incredibly directed scene. This is music! My music! Your music! Your music! But, but, and, and listen, I... <laughs> <laughs> and there are things here that I have, because everybody's thinking, and, they, they, and they, they, everything here plays into everything that's wrong that's going on right now. But man, everybody's playing this so brilliantly. And I, you know, and sometimes I wonder, you know, bugging out, I think bugging out means what he says, but everybody's, do people really mean what they say? Or is everybody just trying to say the meanest things that they can because everybody's starting to get on everybody's nerves? Mm-hmm. Or is this people's true nature? Did it take this moment to bring out what people were really, really feeling about everyone? Because, you know, I look at this and I see, you know, I, I, I think about who dropped the slur first. You know, I think about who's the one that's pushing this situation, who's the instigator, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up in a little bit. Say your- Somebody in the chat said, I am yelling too! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why! <laughs> it's too late because once words are said, things escalate resulting in the police showing up because Raheem attacks, he attacks Sal, the police show up, try to get him out of there, and it all results in the death of Radar Raheem. Gary, that's enough! Gary, that's enough, man! You know, and I look at that and uh, there's a very interesting point to all of this, I'll make it a little bit, but as we know, that's not even the part where things really blew up. They, they, it's almost like they were about to kill Sal mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and his sons until Mookie, of course, goes and throws a trash can through the window and then they focus their attention on the pizzeria and burn that to the ground. <laughs> you know, so what's interesting here to me is that as hard as this is to watch, and as hard as it is to see somebody being murdered by the police, Spike Lee makes it hard for us to, 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 to I think for a lot of people to sympathize. To, 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 it makes it hard for people to sympathize and also, he's also giving it to the people out there who want to say, well, he deserved it. You know, I think that's one of the things that's hard right here because, you know, Radio Raheem is, is you know, I'm looking at him here 
Red, or he, Red, and what I think of this great about Spike Lee is that he's challenging people with his death. Are you going to be the person mm. to sit up here? He's he's looking at your morality and challenging you and see where you, to see where you stand because, you know, Red or Raheem is not a sympathetic person, and I think it's great that. Spike Lee did not make him that. Mm -hmm. He didn't make him some innocent that's, that you could easily say, that boy didn't do nothing to nobody. Mm -hmm. Radio Raheem, I don't care what you say, is not really a good guy, man. You know, like I said, he's he's abrasive, he's confrontational. Uh, you saw how he had his prejudice against the Koreans and all that, like everybody else in his neighborhood has a prejudice against somebody else. He was about to kill Sal. Now, I think he's putting it out there to see where people stand because he's not a sympathetic character. Where are you going to be on this? Are you going to be somebody who looks at this and you, you're willing to admit that he's a, not a good person, but also willing to admit that he didn't deserve to die? Are you going to be this person that says, well, I mean, he didn't do what the cops told him to do. <laughs> so, mm. you know, because I read stuff online where people oh, try to justify imagine. Radio Raheem's death and yeah. people come in all the time. And I'm one of those people I say, listen. I will tell you, Radio Raheem was not a good person in this movie, at least not the way, not from the little that we saw of him, but he did not deserve to die. This movie has just been able to affirm its legacy because, yes, we still have people who are assaulted, murdered by police. And nowadays you have like all these news organizations that are like, well, they, they weren't this, you know, uh, this uh -huh. innocent person. Yeah. Like, but that's yeah. not the point. That's it's not the, point, the fact yeah. that they should just because, yes, they, they also did bad things in their past. You can dig all that up, but they shouldn't be killed mm -hmm. <laughs> like on Especially the spot. Some of the and everybody else says stop. And that's what and that's what what Spike Lee was saying in 1989. Yeah. <laughs> over yeah. 30 years ago. This is you understand. This is like 28 years before George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Sal, Sal's a, a very complex character here with this because is Sal a victim? Yeah. And, you know, and they wrongly blame the death of Radio Raheem on Sal, man, to the point where they're about to turn on him. Like I said, I feel like they're about to kill him. And this is, uh, you know, and this is this this is after it looked like people love Sal, man. This is people, you know, the, just early in the day, people were defending Sal. Would you like to sign a petition to boycott Sal's famous pizzeria? What? what? Man, I was born and raised on Sal's pizza. What the f*** are you talking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I hate to, I hate to actually defend Bugging Out, but Bugging Out, you know, the, the neighborhood I think is turning on Sal at this moment because one, they're still under the shock of the radio Raheem being, you know, being killed in front mm -hmm. of them mm -hmm. and they want something to blame. Yeah. And, you know, and you're the cause of police coming. I don't care if you call them or not, but also just minutes ago, they saw the, what they probably think is the real side of Sal. You know, when Sal starts dropping the N word, mm -hmm. Sal, Sal is talking about, take that jungle music out. See the thing with Sal, that think bugging out is right about when he says get some black people on that wall. He says, you know, I don't ever see any any American I Italians coming in here. Mm -hmm. I only see black people in here. And Sal tries to sit up here and justify that by saying, well, you know, they love my food. I've been in this neighborhood for a long time. You know, I I, I love the people. Sal does not really love the people, man. As much as he he might tell himself that. He might convince himself that, but he does not. And let, let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. Because there's a scene we sit down with his son, uh, you know, Pino, played by John Turturro. And he actually reveals the real reason why he's in this neighborhood. Maybe we could, can we sell this and open up a new one in our own neighborhood? There's too many pizzerias already there. He didn't want to open up in another neighborhood because he didn't want to compete. In this neighborhood here, Real estate was probably cheaper. You know, he, he there was less competition. And really, when you think about it, you know, it, it, bugging out was wrong to be with the approach that he was taking. But in a sense, he's kind of right. Like, what are you giving back to this neighborhood? Mm -hmm. You say you love the people, but what are you what are you doing for the neighborhood? Nothing. You're here because it's just cheaper and less competition. That was the real Sal coming out when uh, he was upset, when he was yelling at bugging out. I mean, not uh, well, bugging out and Radio Raheem, man. You know, and they saw that finally. They saw what this guy was about. You know, at least that's the way I saw it. Well, I, I, I always feel that you can't judge a person based on how they act on their worst day. 
Like if I, if I took get your worst moment and I just said, this is who he is, that wouldn't be right. It, and there's, there's, there's going to be more to you than that. And while uh, Sal might not be a, a mm-hmm. lover of, of black people, uh, it, it, he, you know, he, not only did he not have any trouble, you know, t- accepting their money, but he wasn't wasn't actively going after anybody. I mean, you I feel like everybody in this film has to be judged on the fact that it's hot and tensions are high, especially at that point. And he's got everybody in his face. Uh, what, what, you, what you see come out is that's certainly a part of Sal, uh, but it is an extreme situation. And he is. Everybody's yelling at each other and trying to say yeah. the most hurtful things they can. Yeah. yeah. The only thing that I see is that I just don't think Sal thinks he's the person that he thinks he is. Oh, no. yeah. No, no he's no. sitting up here saying, I'm about the neighborhood. It's like, no, it's a business move. Yeah. You know, you. I don't think he has contempt for these yeah. people, but I do think he feeds into those racist thoughts about certain parts of these people. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. I, don't, and I don't think he loves his neighborhood. I think he loves... I think he I think he loves not having to compete with other people and being a thriving business in this neighborhood. But, you know, I, I, I but I don't think he's malicious in any way. I just think he doesn't. I think he thinks he's something different than what I, he really I, I, is. I'll, I'll give you that. He, he, yeah. He, I mean, like, like most people, they, they think one thing of themselves and they're in denial about who yeah. they are. And that's the those are the characters of the movie. To be fair, like everyone is like that. Like everyone yeah. wants to present themselves as a, in a specific way. But you really when you see them, it's like, oh, you're not really like that. Everybody in this in this in this movie has moments where, and that's the complexities of life. I don't think any of these people are like true true villains, except for again, maybe the cops. Yeah, that, yeah, that, <laughs> that, that one cop for yeah. sure. But I don't think anybody's true true villains here. I don't think anybody's truly good. They're complex like human beings are, and they just had a really. This was like this uh, awful, terrible day, you know, mm-hmm. where things finally came to a head. Even though this fool did not help at all. <laughs> 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 Screw the top of his lungs. Like, man, why don't you calm down? I was just told him, like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to get some photos in here. Yeah. yeah. What, what yeah. I got to do to get you out and of my shot? And the next day, he would have come up with something else. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what, what he would have done. Yeah. 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 I would yeah. just humor him all the time. That's what Spike Lee is trying to say. I got no answers here, man. Because there are no answers to be had just yet. Except that one simple thing, and there's no answer to it. It's just some advice. We all have to understand each other. At some point, how we get to that point, I don't know. But we have to do that at some point. Other, otherwise, the cycle will continue. Mm-hmm. And he even said somewhat to, so, something that affects uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the movie with Senior Love Daddy, who comes in and just simply says that one message right there. We're going to learn to live with each other. I don't know how, but we're going to have to. I saw it. Are we going to live together? Together, are we going to live? You know, that's... Uh, that's it. That's in the movie right there. You know, there's a, a couple of scenes after that, but that wraps it up along with a quote from Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. <laughs> and even then, right when the quote from, <laughs> right when the quote from Malcolm from Martin Luther King comes up and is saying, hey, violence is not the answer. Of the, you know, if we if we if we villainize our enemies, we won't understand them. And everybody's saying, OK, oh, that's yeah, that's a good yeah, man. Okay, Martin, cool. then, then Malcolm X comes up and like, yeah, but you with me though. <laughs> like, All right, I don't know what to do anymore, man. Goes then you see why then. Spike Lee put in that whole thing of love and hate. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's that's a part of the message of the movie that's hopeful. Oh, well, there you go, y'all. Uh, I think that's our discussion right there of do the right thing and why it is such a masterpiece and why it is very relevant, not only for Black History Month, but any month. <laughs> yeah, right. Just for the times. Yeah. I mean, is it, with what's going on today, I mean, these issues, most of this movie, I mean, it's sad because we look at most of this movie and like we ain't saw the damn thing. You know, it's gotten a little better. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's just odd to watch older movies, even from like 10 or 15 years ago. And there's in them, this thing's yeah. in them and you're like. Oh yeah, that doesn't exist anymore, and nobody looks at it this way. Yeah. And yeah. this is cringe. Mm. And yeah. oh boy, did we really think like that? And you watch this, and you're like, "Huh, was this made last?" Oh yeah, week? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, one thing has gotten better. Brooklyn is such a nice place now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all those restaurants and boutiques they got now. Yeah, ain't no bookies yeah. running around. No. Problem no. solved. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, so you got a you get a white woman at brunch in the neighborhood. It's good, man. <laughs> all good. Um, somebody said rating. Well, I mean, it's more of a discussion, but if I had to give it a rating, I'm, I'd give it what I probably would have given it years ago had I had that rating system. It's a better than sex movie for me, man. 
Uh, it's a brilliant movie. It is a masterpiece. 